The Pope has approved a new addition to the Latin Rite Mass. The name of St. Joseph will be included after the usual prayer to the Virgin Mary. Up until now, the only reference to St. Joseph was in the so-called Roman Canon and was introduced by Blessed John XXIII during the Second Vatican Council. Currently, the decree has only been published in Latin. So after the reference to the Virgin Mary, the phrase reads, Cum Beato Joseph Eus Sponso, which translates to St. Joseph, her husband. I just wanted to comment on how happy I am that St. Joseph's name has been added to all the Eucharistic prayers at the Mass. I found that I was... Um, I had a growing devotion to St. Joseph over the past year. Partially that may have been because I was at St. Joseph's Seminary, uh, so perhaps his patronage aided me in some way. I also find it interesting thinking a lot about how he can bring us closer to Christ. And what I found this year was that I was reflecting a lot about the Nazarene life of Jesus Christ, the hidden life we call it, which a good deal of his life is. It's hidden. It's hidden in Nazareth. And what that sort of would indicate is that the only way to kind of understand what was going on, and of course people have tried to account for what he was doing, he was going to India, or he was going to England, right? he was doing all this kind of stuff, because we're not content with a Jesus who lives quietly and lives in a hidden way in Nazareth. The only way to kind of deal with that is to know Christ, is to get closer to Christ, and to get closer to his holy family, which comes to us through the church. St. Ignatius of Loyola has a, a spiritual method, a spiritual exercises. Uh, or basically you enter into the text of the Gospels with your imagination. You, you imagine yourself in a scene from the Gospels. You imagine what it would have been like, what the air would have been like, what the ground is like, what it looks like, and how you feel as you watch what happens, as you watch Jesus heal a blind man. Or in some case, you may imagine yourself to be the blind man. And once you're fully immersed in that, then Christ comes to you. And then you kind of, like, you imagine what you would say to him or what he might say to you. And of course, this is all done under the aid of spiritual direction, of course. But... That's what you have to do kind of for the Nazareth situation, to try to understand what Jesus was doing there. And the hidden life of Jesus is very important for understanding him, understanding his mission, because it's important for understanding what it means to be a Christian. Uh, Colossians 3 says that uh, our lives are hidden with Christ. You have died and our lives are hidden with Christ. Um, a great deal of the Christian life is, is hiddenness in a lot of sense, both in humility and in, in hiding... Uh, in veiling yourself kind of in a, in a humble way, tr trying to not exalt yourself, uh, following Christ's example and emptying yourself to others, um, not seeking glory for yourself, and also realizing uh, that your worth is not just determined by what you do or how well you do it, per se, but it's hidden in Christ. It's, it's objectively found in Jesus Christ, not in uh, how much people respect you or esteem you or how much money you make or, or anything like that, anything that we worry about. Uh, Christ models this for us, by living in a hidden way in Nazareth and working with his stepfather, with his adopted father, maybe if you will, Saint Joseph, and and this and it just raises a lot of interesting questions because this was something I was thinking about this year, about the hidden life of Jesus, and understanding Christ's humanity, because we know that uh, in Christ's divine nature he is omniscient. And in his human nature, though, he's fully human, which means he's not omniscient, which is why he's able to grow in knowledge, as the Gospel of Luke says. That his human nature was, it was in perfect agreement with his divine nature, but it had to kind of um, grow up to it and, and learn and assimilate. And I've noticed, um, I mean, in the early church, what did, if you look at the kind of early Christian literature, I think it focuses mainly on Jesus as uh, maybe the triumphing hero. All the kind of uh, the, the early Christian, like, fiction, maybe if you want to call it that, that was written after the New Testament. Uh, Mainly its depictions of Jesus are uh, as a great miracle worker, or El I mean, love it's heretical and it's Gnostic and he doesn't even have a real body, right? Or a lot of it's about like the harrowing of hell or whatever. It's about him going to hell and freeing everybody in a great triumphant way. And uh, and that's kind of his emphasis on his divine aspect. And nowadays, most of the fiction and writing about Jesus uh, that imaginatively deals with him focuses on his humanity. Uh, sometimes to the exclusion of his divinity, Last Temptation of Christ and things like that. Or even ones that aren't, that aren't necessarily heretical, like Anne Rice's novels that are narrated by Jesus, uh, are still focusing on his human aspect, right? His human, his human struggles, because that's, I guess, what we... Those are a good litmus test of the culture, right? Um, we are very, very uh, psychological, right? And we're interested in humanity and in people's existential struggles and their subjective experiences. And, and it is very interesting for me to think about the fact that um, psychology and... Uh, existentialist philosophy point out all our feelings of alienation and angst 
and longing and uh, an estrangement from each other and all this kind of thing. Uh, and we would say as Christians that that's a description of the reality of original sin. But those ideologies would say that those are integral to being human. To be human is to feel alienated or it is to feel angst and all this kind of thing. Um, the Christian scheme says, no, those are actually aberrations. We fell into those. And Our Lady and Our Lord were conceived without original sin. And I think a lot about, like, well, what does, what does that look like? Like, what... Because I've, never, because I've never seen it, right? I, I, I wonder a lot about what it would mean to be able to look at human beauty without lust and to appreciate it the way God intended. Or what it would mean uh, to feel hunger without ever feeling uh, the natural concupiscence of... And again, this is what I mean. It's not that they couldn't have sinned. They could have chosen to sin. They could have chosen to lust. They could have felt hunger and then felt and then experienced the the kind of um, as overly attached feeling towards food. They could have felt that. They should could have chosen to be gluttons. They could have chosen to be greedy. But they didn't have the natural concupiscence. They didn't have that natural uh, propensity towards it. And I wonder a lot what that would even look like. Um, and of course, I think we struggle to even understand what it would be like to. To, to be a human who doesn't have original sin, what would that even mean? How would you feel anger that was genuinely righteous? Um, and things like that. But Christ's human nature had to be formed, and God committed that formation to his human family. And St. Joseph was the one put in charge of that. All right. And that's really interesting. Um, of course, St. Joseph is himself a hidden figure. He's a mysterious figure. He doesn't say anything in the New Testament. He's, he's not given any quotation, right? Uh, we're told he was a righteous man, and we're told what he did at times, and we can infer a lot, but we don't know much about him, right? Um, since Catholic, uh, Catholics understand that Mary was a perpetual virgin, we know that their relationship was, was chaste, it was celibate. And the East and the West have different understandings of uh, St. Joseph in this respect, right? Uh, because it has to do with uh, Jesus' brothers. Um, the New Testament mentions Jesus' brothers, and we can wonder, like, well, if he, if Mary was a virgin, what do those mean? Uh, there's one tradition that says it's uh, those who refer to his cousins, right? Because brother was a very generic term in Hebrew, it just meant relative. Uh, the other uh, explanation is that uh, Saint Joseph had previously been married and had children, and his wife had died, and then he uh, took on the Blessed Virgin Mary, and so those are uh, Jesus' you know, Saint Joseph's children, right? Uh, Jesus' legal brothers. It's interesting to me, like, would, uh, it'd be interesting to find out what people think, uh, which one of those two people are more attracted to. Because, in one theory, um, St. Joseph's a young man, right? And he takes on Mary as his wife, and he devotes his whole life to being celibate. He's just like a, a, a Catholic, like a Western Catholic seminarian, right? He's a young man who decides to be celibate and, and gives up everything for the sake of Christ. I can see how that would respond. To, uh, someone would respond to that. Someone would be attracted to that. Uh, maybe identify more with him. See him as more. It's more ascetical, maybe. I actually prefer the other one, though, um, for for what it's worth. Um, since Saint Joseph was not conceived without original sin, he did have original sin. It makes more sense that it would have been an older man, a man who would have gr grown into righteousness in the way that uh, all the rest of us kind of have to, and had gained exceptional righteousness, and, like maybe the greatest righteousness you could achieve without. Be, uh, even if he were born with original sin. Um, it also makes sense of how uh, St. Joseph died, seems to have died early in Christ's life, uh, because we don't see him again in the Gospels after Jesus is lost and, he, and they find him in the temple. That would make sense. If he was an older man, that would have happened. That would have been the case. And, uh, this, is, and this is the interesting thing for me, is that if he was an older man than, or, or, or anything, how was he forming... What was he teaching Jesus Christ? When they were in the carpentry shop, what was the thing he was modeling for Jesus Christ? William Barclay, who I don't think was a necessarily a really orthodox theologian, but he has a book called The Mind of Jesus. And in there he points out that even though we don't see much of Joseph in the New Testament, because Jesus called God Father so easily, that actually tells us a lot about St. Joseph. Martin Luther actually said that when he prayed to our Father, he winced, because his idea of a father which had been shaped by his own father, was this uh, strict German miner who was very sharp and very, uh, maybe kind of um, a bit merciless in his punishment. So for him, the word father didn't necessarily have positive connotations, or just not, not unreservedly positive. Um, the fact that 
um, the name Father sprang so readily to Jesus' lips as he thought of God, who he loved so much. For Barclay, he tells, tells us a lot about St. Joseph. Um, and that's just it. God chose St. Joseph. God the Father is modeled for God the Son in his human nature by St. Joseph. That is very fascinating. That is very, very fascinating. Um, because it, it sets up for what it even means to be a Christian, which is to be a human who is who bears God and represents God to the world. That is fascinating to me. And particularly because he's the only member of the Holy Family who had original sin. Between Mary and Jesus and Joseph, he was the one with original sin. And he's... And he... So, I don't know. For, for me, when I think about the communion of saints, of being in union with people in heaven who have been completely purified through purgatory of all their sin, of all their sinful propensities, who are not perfect... And beholding the beatific vision, I think that I'm in communion with them. I found that that drew me to Saint Joseph. It it made me think like the way I feel in the face of that, the, the way I feel to be counted among the saints. It's how I think Saint Joseph must have sometimes felt is that he was living with and he was carried caring for. He was com, com, um, the trust of these people was committed to him who were sinless and one of whom was God. He was in charge of that. I, I can imagine St. Joseph very much responding like John the Baptist. You know, when Jesus comes to be baptized by him, and John the Baptist says, I should be baptized by you. And Jesus says, no, you, you do this, right? Uh, or Simon of Cyrene, right? Who, um, really, Jesus should be helping carry his cross, which is what he does for us. And yet he commits himself so that Simon helps him carry his cross. This is what Jesus does. He has emptied himself and put himself in our hands and committed his mission to us. All right. Jesus, you know, instead of just continuing and going all over the world, doing what he was doing in Galilee, uh, and thus not impeding his own mission with his sin, because he was perfect, he instead gives the responsibility to imperfect sinful people. And that started, it seems, with St. Joseph to me. Uh, and that is fascinating. That makes me identify with him. That makes me call upon his intercession. That draws me to him quite a bit. By the way, for those of you who saw Man of Steel, what did you think of uh, Jonathan Kent as portrayed by Kevin Costner? How did that compare to other um, incarnations of Jonathan Kent from, like, say, Smallville or something like that? Because I can see very much him as an interpretation of the character of St. Joseph, a hard-working, solid, honest, uh, laboring man commissioned with the task of raising a god. Um, I don't know. A lot of people praise Kevin Costner's performance in that movie. What do you think? Is that what, what you imagine St. Joseph to be like? I don't know. Just reflect on that. Feel free to comment. Any question asked in this video, uh, go right ahead and comment or make a video response to it. I'm just very curious what you think. There's a, there's a tradition as well. Um, when it, it, St. Joseph is minded to put uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary away because she is found to be with child. And uh, being a righteous man, he doesn't want to expose her to shame or whatever. So he's got to put her away quietly until an angel comes and says, Don't be afraid. I'd always rather, I think most people read this, and maybe this is an example of what I was saying before, about maybe two different ways of approaching Jesus, or, or of approaching holiness. Um, I'd always thought that that meant St. Joseph assumed that she had cheated on him, and therefore he was going to just kind of quietly put her away so that he wouldn't uh, expose her to scandal, and everything would be okay. But there's a tradition from the Church Fathers, actually, that St. Joseph knew that she was perfect, and knew that she was sinless, and knew that she was pledged to be a virgin forever. And didn't feel worthy of being her spouse. It didn't feel worthy of raising the Christ child. And that's why the angel had to come and say, "Don't be afraid. Go keep keep her as your wife and, and raise this child." I don't know. It, whichever I, it's another example. Which of those two do you find more appealing? Is it that Joseph thought that uh, Mary had cheated on him, and this, as a righteous man, wanted to protect her from uh, shame or possibly stoning? Right. Um, and then the angel had to inform him, no, 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 this is really from God. Or was it that he felt unworthy of being with her and with Jesus Christ um, in the sort of a St. Peter way, you know, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. I don't know, which, other, which one of those two do you find more appealing? I don't know, you, you, you decide. But, and again, since he's such a hidden guy, we can only extrapolate based on his actions. And this is the thing, St. Joseph's, the figures in the Bible, like the Blessed Virgin or St. Joseph, they, because they're so hidden, because they just appear slightly, all we can do is kind of take those little clues that we have and infer from there. Like Sherlock Holmes said once that he could infer the existence of both an Atlantic and a Pacific Ocean 
even if you'd never heard of either of them, just from examining drops of water from both, you'd be able to deduce, you know, infer the existence of whole oceans and the fact that those oceans were different. All we have are a few droplets of knowledge about St. Joseph, and we have to infer a whole ocean about him, right? Uh, we have to infer that he was a, gr uh, a good worker. He would have been a reliable worker. He would have been a just worker. Because he seems to have died early on, uh, we can infer that he died in the arms of Mary and Joseph. The last thing we see of him is finding Jesus in the temple. Uh, there's a meditation on the Seven Sorrows of Mary written by Eddie Dougherty, who was a, a Maronite priest. Uh, many, many things. His, his wife, Catherine Dougherty, had founded the Madonna House Apostolate. Um, and they ended up uh, be being chased. They ended up not coming together anymore. So he, he went off and became a priest. Uh, at least I think he was a Maronite priest. But he writes a meditation where he does kind of an Ignatian thing and puts himself into the Seven Sorrows of Mary, and he's present and witnesses them. And for the um, losing Jesus in Jerusalem. What he imagines is that the three days that Mary and Joseph spent scrambling around the city trying to find Jesus, Joseph becomes so haggard and he becomes so drained and defeated by the thought that he has lost Jesus, that he's like failed, that you know that he he's that he may have lost the most beautiful and holy thing ever. It's so draining, and the thing that he loves, and the one he loves so much, because that's just it. It wasn't just that Joseph was you know fulfilling his duty to God. He was in a fatherly capacity to God. He, he loved him as a son with an automatic human reaction. It wasn't just a, you know, a religious thing. It was, I think his love for his family, for his adopted son, was a human one. It's the one that any adopted father could have for his son, or for any father could ever have for his son. It was automatic and human and, and instinctive. And it's actually, in Eddie Dower, he's telling you, but it's actually that experience of losing Jesus and having three days of just anguish about it that ends up killing him. That's what weakens him to the point that he will shortly die afterwards. These are the things we have to infer. <laughs> These are the things we have to deduce about him. Um, re read the litany of prayer to St. Joseph and all the things that he's called. He's a terror to demons. Well, that makes sense. Um, in the book of Acts, it says that um, some exorcists try to cast out a demon in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches in. They say, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? Well, if Joseph was a holy man, we can assume that he too was a terror to the demons. Uh, Light of the Patriarchs, right? He, he because of his giving up uh, sexual uh, uh, union for the sake of the Holy Family, yeah, those who are trying to live a chaste life can follow him. Those who are leading a family life can follow him. He's interesting this way. This is a very unique situation where he can uh, model both the married life and the single celibate chaste life. And these are all things that we can learn from him, especially, you know, nowadays, especially now. Uh, where Josephology is kind of becoming more of a thing, and uh, we're being told to call on St. Joseph more to help, um, to, to call on God's aid for the sake of all the problems with the church, with the problems plaguing the church and the problems from within the church. Uh, these are all things that I find very fruitful, and, and the one last thing is because I identify so much with St. Joseph, what I found was that um, St. Ignatius has a, a method called the Triple Colloquy, and what that is, is that in your uh, prayer, in your imagination, you go to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she brings you to Jesus Christ, and then Jesus brings you to his Father. The triple conversation. And what I found was, I was so daunted by the thought of talking to the Blessed Virgin Mary, because she seemed so... Because it was hard to just imagine being friendly and relaxed with the Holy Family, and feeling comfortable to go up and ask one of them for something. I went to St. Joseph first, in my imagination uh, and in my prayer, I asked St. Joseph to bring me to his spouse, and then she brought me to Jesus, and then she brought me to God. So I had kind of a quadruple colloquy. Um, and I found that to be very fruitful, and therefore I'm very glad and I'm very happy that St. Joseph is going to be uh, hopefully a greater part of, of the church's liturgy and hopefully of the church's thought and of our personal devotion. Uh, it's exactly what we need now. Anyways, that's all I have to say. Uh, hope that w hope there was some valuable stuff for you in there. Uh, take care.